Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Mi Weekly, rather. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to all of our shows on the network at that link via your favorite podcast catcher. You can join our Discord server, which is an amazing community. Uh, our webcasts, subscribe to our mailing list, all kinds of stuff. We have streaming platforms. We're on Twitch, YouTube. Make sure you go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. All righty. So we're continuing the series on uh, the container lab that I built, which kind of, I don't know where it, it all stemmed from. I was trying to show exploits and stuff. So I started building containers. Then I started building more containers. Then I started putting uh, all kinds of different tools. And then someone asked, hey, can you get windows in there? And I was like, I don't know, maybe I got I to gotta look into that. I'm like, it's kind of weird because I'm on Linux, so this could get weird. And it's going to get weird. I'm just throwing that out there. It is kind of weird. Um, but if you go to uh, uh, github.com forward slash security weekly, the vault, and I put the link in the show notes, the vault hub lab GitHub repository uh, is where I have the, there's a stable version out there. And then there's my dev uh, branch, which, and I'm trying to get a Windows domain controller in there. Uh, and then get them to join the domain together. So I'm working on that. I'm way better at Linux than Windows. Just for one is one thing I learned in this project. Uh, so the other thing is inside of the Volhub lab, right? I've got the uh, HTTP web server. I've got Trevor C2. I've got Merlin. And I've got a bunch of vulnerable Linux targets as well as a Kali Linux instance. And it's all configurable. Like the Kali one, you can tell it how much you want to install by default or not. And so... Uh, that's the, the kind of starting point. There is an interview coming up with Dave Kennedy that we pre-recorded already to talk about Trevor C2 uh, and C2 communications in general. So make sure you check that out. Um, and so you, you can download Spin This Lab Up uh, yourself. Uh, it's similar to other labs you might spin up in cloud environments, right? But that some of them like, you know, incur costs for the students. So I thought it was kind of nice to spin this up on your own. Now, this is assuming you're running Linux as your host operating system. I, I do intend, if someone wa wants to take this on, I accept pull requests, you can spin this up in Docker on Windows. I'm assuming that's possible, right? It would just be flip-flopped, right? You'd run your Windows inside of Docker containers and Linux inside of Docker containers with Windows as your host operating system. That would be cool. Um, and, and so I, I fully, I want to get to that point as well. Um, I'm going to show you how to do it in Linux using Docker with containers to spin up all the things I just talked about, including windows which actually runs inside of uh, a virtualization layer uh, qmu that that runs inside of the docker container that runs on linux now i didn't i didn't invent this just want to throw that out there i link to a a, a a few resources on this one but the one i want to give credit to is the individual whose blog post i linked to on medium that showed me how to do this there's other resources as well and i'll put more resources in the in the github uh, repository as well. I have them flagged. I just got to uh, integrate them. So like this isn't my original idea or my original work. However, I did rewrite uh, pretty much oh, a lot of things in front, off of that medium post because by default that medium post uh, did not work for me. And according to the comments, it didn't work for a lot of other people who read that medium post because some things have changed since that post was written, I think about a year or year ago uh, or so. Um, so I actually, I was nice. I made a comment on that post. I said, hey, great job. I made some modifications to get it working. Uh, and you can go to my GitHub and, and look in the Win10 folder uh, in my GitHub repository. You get a Docker file, uh, a startup script, and a Vagrant file that'll make it work for you. Um, so I shared that with the original author. I haven't checked back to see if he saw that or commented on it. Um, but there was people with lots of questions like, I got this error. I'm like, I got around that error. And they're like, I got this error. I'm like, I got the error too. I'm like, what's the and, and, and there was no solution. So I had to do a lot of a lot of googling on the internet and, and experimental trial and error uh, to get this to work. Now the other option is um, Detection Lab is great, and Detection Lab also can spin all of this up, um, but not inside of Docker. So you can spin all this up using Vagrant and Libvirt. Uh, which was somewhat new to me, the virtualization layer uh, built on top of Linux uh, that uses QMU. So you can 
you can spin this up natively uh, on Linux. I, does Windows support Vagrant and all that stuff? I'm not. It does. Yes, there are Windows Vagrant yeah. systems. Yeah. So you could spin this up, and that that's more like running virtual machines rather than containers, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and so a lot of people, uh, Tyler, I know you you do this probably on Hyper V, right? Uh, there are some people that basically have a way. I think you shared this link with me actually. That when you're a penetration tester and you want to spin up a Windows environment with a domain controller, maybe you want to mirror a customer environment, you can use similar techniques to what I'm showing you today um, to do that in, in a couple of different ways using the technologies I just described, right? So the, the use case, what I'm getting at, long-winded way of saying the use case is I want to spin up a lab. I'm going to be able to customize some of the components, but I want to be able to just spin it up, right? I don't want to have to go through a lot of work to spin it up. I want to run some commands and spin it up. They get that right. Yeah, you can you can do this all with PowerShell mm -hmm. uh, using the a ADDS deployment, uh, which will deploy in Azure, mm -hmm. uh, or you can have it deploy to Hyper V via PowerShell. You can do it with uh, VMware ESXi. Uh, I personally use VMware Workstation if I'm building custom stuff. Yep. Uh, full labs, I use PowerShell and spin that to Azure. Uh, Vagrant, obviously Detection Lab, Red Elk, yep. uh, all of those are, are great options. But this, the Docker version is one kind of missing piece to to having used all the technologies. And they all have strong suits and, and different ways and, and use cases. The Terraform stuff works great with Azure and, and AWS, not so good for local labs. You know, there's a bunch of things uh, for Ansible, but uh, each of these has their strong suits, so it's good to have all of them for individual use cases. This is very fast, very uh low resource and very diverse for, for being able to do quick things. Yeah, and my use case for it was I had this really cool lab that I spent a lot of time on that was based on Docker and primarily Linux containers, and I wanted to throw Windows in the mix and not lose what I you know had done and not re recreate everything because uh, I think one of the positive things on this is it's really easy to configure vulnerable containers and containers that run different types of software. Super easy, like Docker file, even if you're just like learning how to build a container using a Docker file, it's pretty straightforward, right? If you know Linux, it, it's not that far away from being able to spin up containers in different configurations. Um, it's totally easy. It's really not that hard. I mean, come on, if you can do the Docker, if I can do you it. Know, Linux, Windows and Docker is no big deal. Nothing happens. You don't let the magic smoke out. It's not a problem, right? Yeah. Well, uh, the kind of downside is the this libvert um, subsystem, I would call it, is relatively new and it's like a little messy. Like you're going to spend some time. Uh, getting that to work. It's a little little dicey, and it does heavily rely on some of the stuff on your host uh, operating system. So uh, I constructed doesn't, a... Go ahead, Lee. I was going to say, doesn't doesn't Window get kind of upset if you don't have some sort of a head on it? Um, so for the, in when I spin up Windows, um, it is not headless. I can remote desktop into it. Oh, okay. So yeah. we we virtualized that. I can't. Words. I can't show you. I'm having some issue on this system. I spun it up in my other workstation just fine. I spun it up in this system. I got some error about IPv6 or something, so I got to uh, adjust the configuration. But I can. You can get it from the GitHub repository, and I'll show you all the configuration and walk mm -hmm. you through it. Um, I, 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 I can't show it running. It's basically a PowerShell module. Lee, you can actually turn the GUI on and off, as well as deploy mm. things like uh, server core that doesn't have a GUI, but Again, that's a module with inside PowerShell to enable that, uh, which takes a little bit lower resources and things like uh, domain controllers. You can obviously do that for labs with the, the core environment, which makes it really nice. But everything's managed through server manager anyway now. Uh, so you do have the, yeah. the option to RDP still, but the, the server manager covers what, what you usually interact with. So. And so it, the blog post gives, me, gives you the image. If you go to that blog post that I linked to in the show notes, uh, it gives mm -hmm. you kind of the diagram, right? You've got Linux as your host operating system. You've got Docker. Uh, and here you can see this Docker file. I'm building a new Ubuntu 20.04 uh, container. Um, so that runs on top of Docker. Now, inside of this container, you can see the packages I'm installing. Um, one of those is QMU KVM. The other mm -hmm. is libvirt, uh, which gives you a virtualization layer inside of your Docker container, which I was like... Uh, like, don't mm -hmm. use this in production is like is what I'm saying. Great for a lab. I would never deploy this uh, in production. And this libvert stuff, from what I've been reading, is 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 kind of new. Um, so you get your base packages installed, then you pull down uh, Vagrant into the container and install it. 
then you install the Vagrant libvert plugin. Then the next line right here that we're looking at is line 22. This is where you add your box from uh, Vagrant. Now, I want to pause on this one. I probably should create my own Vagrant box and control everything that goes inside of it. That is like no. an in, probably another two-part technical segment <laughs> to show you how to do that. Tyler, have you done that? Have you created your own Vagrant box? Like it's it's involved. There is a lot to that, and I highly recommend it if you're building larger scale or more complicated lab setups, especially mm -hmm. when you start to talk about domains. You will probably have to do that anyway. Right. But yeah, pain in the ass. <laughs> so I'm pulling a, a, a Vagrant box uh, from a, a user who has a pretty good repository. I'm trusting him at this time. Again, I'm not using this production. I'm using a lab. You could totally put malware, or if his account gets compromised, you could put malware in there. Um, his, his repository is called Peru, and he has a Windows 10 Enterprise uh, X64 evaluation Vagrant box, just essentially like a virtual machine that I'm pulling down inside of my container. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm adding that again. I just want to note, like, this is someone else's, you know, virtual machine file, essentially. So take that with a grain of salt. I'm doing this kind of an exercise to show that it does work. Mm -hmm. The next step I would recommend is to, again, have your own box. Or you could also use some of the Detection Lab stuff. They have some boxes uh, available. It's configured differently than what I'm showing you here uh, right now. Um, but I, I trust... Um, is it Chris Long that does Detection Lab? Did I get that right? Yeah, I trust Chris more than this other guy who I don't know. <laughs> um, but you could you could adopt this and and pull in some of the boxes that um, uh, Chris is building in in Detection Lab. It is a great job, and he now supports uh, Vagrant and, and Libvirt as well. He calls it Ooh. very highly experimental. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> Um, that means it'll break. Yeah, that he's like, I'm not even answering. Like, if you open up a Git issue or send me email, he's like, I don't want to hear it. Like, this is experimental, um, and I don't blame him because it is. Um, so, so that means that only 50 companies will put it in production next week. Yeah, probably. I know that happens, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm doing my Vagrant uh, init, which spins it up, and I'm copying over my Vagrant file and uh, my startup. So I did have to configure my own Vagrant file which I don't think, this might have been in the original one, but I've added stuff uh, into it and kind of balanced it. So interestingly enough, in the original post, they were like, oh, you need to open up you know, port 3389 for RDP. But since the box I'm pulling down is built from his Vagrant file, he was already doing that. So I got an error that said that port's already been forwarding. <laughs> so this Vagrant file kind of is a second stage uh, Vagrant file, if you will. Um, so in here, I'm setting the the box to that uh, the box that uh, is available in the Vagrant Cloud. Uh, I am setting a specific IP address for this is the IP address within like QMU, right? So there's a network diagram in the blog post that I link to, and uh, you're going through multiple network layers here, right? So this Windows box has a 192.168.121.10 address but that's in the virtualization uh, QMU that's running inside of Docker. Inside of Docker, Docker, the Docker container has a network interface on the 192.168.121 network and has an inter network interface on, in my configuration, 10.1.1.16, um, which then is a bridge to my host network. All right? To go, if you go look at the diagram in the medium post, it'll, it'll make sense to you. Um, so that so I, uh, in the original post, he was not setting an IP address, and that's one of the changes I made. I said, I want a static IP address so I can write firewall rules with that static IP address on the fly. Essentially, it lets you do Docker Compose up, and it'll all spin up, and everything has static IPs. Uh, I'm also forwarding mm -hmm. port 445 so I can attack it, which is awesome. And then I am that little snippet of PowerShell on line 6 right there will disable the firewall. Now, mm -hmm. you can get crazy with PowerShell if you want. You can do inline PowerShell, as I'm showing you here on line six. You can integrate, if you've written a uh, PowerShell script and saved it to a file, you can have it execute <clears throat> as part of this Vagrant file as well. <coughs> so you can whatever you can do in PowerShell, you can do to this system 
uh, as it's spinning up, which is awesome. And I got a bunch of trial and error stuff here that I commented out. All right. So then once... Question? No. Okay. Once the container has spun up, right? So in the con Docker file in the container, right? Uh, my entry point is startup.sh. So now we're starting to execute this script inside the container. Uh, you, have ah. to, you have to change permissions on... Uh, this is actually your your... This is mapped into the container. I can show you that as well. So your... Uh, if it's a volume or a file in my Docker Compose, uh, it's a device. So you're mapping the dev KVM device into your container. Yeah. Which gives it the ability to run QMU uh, using that KVM uh, device that it needs. Uh, right. So you're changing the permissions on that. Uh, then you're running libvertd and vertlogd. Pretty simple. Then you're bringing up uh, the vagrant uh, box that you uh, configured uh, in your Vagrant file and also in your Docker file, right? So this actually starts up Windows 10. Then I had to go back and remember all my IP tables, chains and uh, tags and all kinds mm -hmm. of routing and all that stuff, right? And so uh, in, I believe, I don't know if it was the version, I think it was the version of Ubuntu that, in, so I, I switched from, his original post had Ubuntu 1804. That wasn't working. So I built this on Ubuntu 20.04. And I believe it was that changed that changed all the firewall rules. So all of the chains were named differently. So his original IP tables rules did not work at all. It was like IP tables chain not found. And I'm like, oh. So I had to rewrite all of the IP tables rules to be compatible with how libvertd is implemented in Ubuntu 20.04. It, that, it was not fun, um, but I did figure it out. So basically, you are port forwarding from the Docker network interface into the virtual network interface that's running in QMU inside of the container. That's all those rules do. The last four disable some of the, the other rules that would make this network traffic uh, be blocked. So I'm disabling that. But all the rules above that, lines 12 through 20, are essentially port forwarding and natting uh, between the Docker virtual network and the QMU virtual network. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That was a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, oh, but bad. I yeah. Um, and How long did this take you to go through? We were, we were counting uh, days. <laughs> and how much sanity? So yes. yes. It's a lot, of, a lot of trial and error. Yes. So with all that, was it worth not just sucking it up and go to Ubuntu 18? It didn't work for me in Ubuntu 18. Oh, well, then yeah. screw that. So we, we had other errors, and when you read his original post and you read the comments to that, Lee, it was a bunch of other uh -huh. people going, I tried this and it didn't work, and I got this error. I'm like, yeah, I got that error too. And I'm like, I, yeah, okay, I don't then. know how to fix that. So I'm like, well, yeah, so. if I'm going to make it work, I might as well make it work in Ubuntu 2004, which is what I'm most familiar with, and it's the more recent version. Um, yeah. So I got different errors, right? But I'm like, these are my errors now, and I'll fix them, right? So <laughs> rather than trying to troubleshoot someone yeah. else's errors, I'll troubleshoot my errors. Um, so you're either going to fix them or try drink heavily or both. Right, right. There was got it. definitely some drinking involved to get Look. to this point. And then I had to convert his... So he was not running it in Docker Compose. Uh, he was just running a Docker run command. So I had to translate oh. his Docker run command... So all the switches uh, that he added to his Docker run command, I had to translate into Docker Compose, which sounds like it's but, like really hard. It's not actually but not you were more in your element there. Where I think you've done a lot with Docker and would yeah. have that. Like, yeah, that was know. that was when I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to translate this all to Compose. I'm like, oh, that wasn't that wasn't that bad. Like so, basically. Um, uh, all the stuff I talked about before. Now he is running this as a privileged container. This is one thing mm -hmm. I haven't gone back and, and tested, and I'm not sure if that's to give the container access to the devices, uh, dev KVM and dev net ton. Uh, I'm not sure if the privileged container has to be running it at a, you know, basically without restriction uh, on Linux to pull this off or not. I haven't tried changing that. What I also found was interesting is in addition to setting privilege to true, 
He's adding some Linux capabilities for net admin and sys admin. And I don't remember by default, I think this might even vary across Docker versions. If you set a container to privileged, I think that gives it all the capabilities. Or it might just be a larger subset of those capabilities that does not include net admin or sys admin. But again, I haven't gone through the testing to go, what if I make it not privileged and specifically allow the capabilities that it needs? Um, or can I just set privilege to true and not add those capabilities? In any case, security wise, you should never do this in any of your containers. No. <laughs> Probably oh. bad. I, uh, I can't help but wonder how much of that is related to trying to run basically a virtual machine infrastructure on in, top of that container. Inside the container. But it's going to do all kinds of stuff to memory and other drivers that you need admin for. That's what I'm thinking, Lee, right? So, yeah, but again, the reason you never do this in production is because it will enable people to do Docker machine escapes. Um, yep. Yeah, which is which is bad. Which would be interesting if you got in Windows, could you do a virtual machine escape that got you into Docker and then do a Docker escape into the host? <laughs> it's very much Inception. <clears throat> uh, and then you have to map a volume too. I didn't look into what, uh, I don't remember what the C group is, but you got to map a, a volume uh, as part of it. Again, like you're running virtualization inside of a container on top of Linux, so there's stuff it needs access to um, as well as the devices. So if you do this, um, oh, here's a link to the post right here, too. So if you do this, it, it doesn't work on this machine, unfortunately. So I can't show it to you running because I don't know what something happened I need to fix. But I was like, I pulled down the uh, master branch from the repo and I ran it on my other machine and it worked. I was like, okay, good. Um, so there's that. Um, let's see. Let's go here yeah so abed some hurry uh july 20th 2020 uh wrote this awesome post uh, this is everything i just talked about right um i wanted to show you the network uh so yeah this is the inception diagram that i was telling you about right kvm qmu hypervisor windows 10 running on top of that linux container docker daemon ubuntu linux base os which i didn't think was possible but obviously it is. Um, and I just wanted to show you the, where is his networking diagram? He had a network diagram on here somewhere. I think I might have scrolled past it already. Maybe not. Uh, maybe it's down here. It does, yeah, right here. Yeah. So you got your main OS, which has uh, a virtual network interface on uh, Docker Zero. Now, his IP addresses are 172.17.0.1. That's the default. I've changed that in Docker to create my own network so I can statically assign IP addresses um, uh, to uh, to the network adapters, right? So get your Docker 0, that container, ETH 0 interface on the container maps to that Docker bridge network with my host. Then there's another virtual network. Verbi 1 is my container's interface on the QMU virtual network, and I'm statically mapping, he was not, sta I'm statically mapping 192.168.121.10 in there. So in my case, my Windows host, uh, your Windows host that you would access in this diagram would be 172.17.0.2. That would take port 3389 with the IP tables rules and send that over to um, your Vagrant instance, which is running Windows 10. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Without this post, it would have taken me a whole heck of a lot longer. So even though like stuff didn't work in this post, I give the author full credit because I wouldn't have gotten any of this to work if it had it not been for this post. So thank you. So you can this pull that down clever. and run it, right? It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. This is pretty what clever. You I give you a lot is. of credit, man, for assembling all these pieces. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. So... Uh, in my dev branch, I have, a, uh, so the Peru guy uh, that publishes the Vagrant boxes also has a Windows 2016 domain controller box, and I've got that pulled in. So I can actually get Windows 10 and Windows 2016 domain controller and 
all of my Linux Docker containers with C2, Linux targets, Kali, all that stuff, mm -hmm. all running on the same network. What I am, uh, when I get some time to come back to this, working on now, because I suck at Windows and PowerShell, I'm just learning PowerShell, um, what I need to do now is get the Windows 10 box to join, well, I have to create, right? You gotta create the domain first on the domain controller and then join the Windows 10 box to that domain. That can right. all be done with code though too. With what? That can all be done with code. You can set your DHCP servers, your DNS scope zones, mm -hmm. uh, promote, set your FISML roles up and add add the domain and then add the box to the domain. So you first add the roles and add the domain and then set up the, the box and, and DNS. And that's all done with PowerShell? Yeah. Yeah. Since I don't know PowerShell that well, that's I'm I'm challenged. I'm gonna you have to spend some more time with me, Tyler. <laughs> so and the other example and in the other example, Tyler sent me a lot of examples. Detection Lab has an example. It's like way more stuff than I needed. <laughs> like way more stuff than I needed. I'm like, I just need to create a domain and join one computer to it. So I need like a subset of that code and not being great with PowerShell yet, uh, you know, it challenging. But all cool stuff to learn. Um, PowerShell is pretty amazing. I'm actually kind of digging it now. Now I have a reason to really learn it because I want to get this working. So because I, I think now, uh, so you know, once that's working, now I've got this really kind of cool lab that I can show stuff right on webcast mm -hmm. and the shows. Right, I've got a working Windows environment, got some Linux targets, I've got C2 infrastructure all kind of sitting on this flat network, which is kind of convenient, right? Where you can show different kinds of attacks and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so how is it keeping track of what talks to what using what address ranges? So all of the, it's a good question, Lee. Excuse me, in my Docker file, um, in the Docker Compose script, there is a network that I create uh -huh. called VolHubNet. Each um, container, I statically assign an IP address uh, on that okay. network. So here's where I define the network. Yep. It's a bridged network with my host adapter uh, on my Linux box. Um, and I define the subnet in the gateway. So my host adapter is always 10.1.1.1. Mm -hmm. um, that's the subnet. And then... As long as I put in this this little block right here, 182 through 184 uh, lines of code, I can statically assign IP addresses to all of the containers. And then uh, I modify my uh, host file on my Linux host, on the host system, uh, to map these all out by name. And I call these the, the this is a little out of date. Um, I have to update this because there's a couple more uh, that's not in this list. So in my Etsy host file, I map all of these out and I so I can reference them by name. So within the containers, I set a container name, I set a host name. So this is always Win10. And then if I modify my host file, uh, I can reference it as Win10. So I don't get confused of like, wait, what IP address is the Windows box again? Like you can reference everything in the lab by name, which is convenient. Because I forget, I'm like, wait, which one was my vulnerable log for j oh right like which one is my trevor c2 like it's all named ip addressed all the same every time which is convenient anyway what do you think important. the overhead what do you think the overhead for the basically extra layer of, of virtualization in there is costing it's, you i think it's much it's it a good question like it no it's I, I haven't like done any performance or load testing but also, mm -hmm. like, this isn't the fastest laptop in the world. Um, it, it doesn't seem to struggle if I spin this whole thing up on it. My other computer is, is a bad test. It's like a 24-core AMD Threadripper. Yeah. So, of course, with, like, 256 gigs of RAM. Yeah, so that one has no problem spinning up the lab. But I, I will you tell know. you that in production, I know people that run multiple levels of VMware. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, I mean, the, the fact that there's actually a, a, an FAQ that says, okay, you can run VMware inside VMware, but you have to have it a dot release behind, you know, uh, like, right. like, and they're running two or three levels because they're running a hypervisor inside of a hypervisor. Like, yeah, like I've seen people run, uh, Kubernetes inside of a Docker container, right? Yeah, it works. You can run ESXi on VMware workstation or fusion 
and that way you can emulate a, a VMware clustered environment. So, and yeah, then but as far as like what the overhead is, I mean, I yeah. wouldn't run this on like a slower system necessarily, but again, I haven't noticed like my machine completely shit in the bed because I spun this up. And you could do some performance tuning. Uh, actually, in Vagrant, in your Vagrant file, there's a ton more options there. If you go to the Vagrant documentation, um, they pretty mm -hmm. well document all of the different options. And so you can... Todd, where can you specify in there? S RAM, CPU, there's a bunch of stuff in your Vagrant file, right, that you can size for this. Yeah, you can customize that Vagrant file very, very heavily. In fact, you do that when you do a lot of the domain stuff because you're going to have you know, something that's your primary FSMAL domain controller that has DNS, DHCP, maybe you have some, some FIPS or Exchange or SQL. All those things need to be sized, and you can do that with inside the config files. Mm. It's really awesome. Uh, I, I feel like even if you bought like a pretty beefy machine, it's still, I think, cheaper than paying, you know, a monthly cost uh, or, you know, for your cloud. I mean, you'd only spin it up in your cloud when you're using it, right? But if you're paying on storage and compute in whatever cloud that you're in, you know, you're, you're giving someone some money every time you want to spin up your lab. And I'm like, that'd be kind of nice to just run this locally too. Also, I want to point out, these are highly vulnerable <laughs> containers and instances, like really like easy remote exploitation uh, on these, as well as like C2 and Kali built in. This is not something you just want to spin up willy nilly uh, inside the cloud. I mean, obviously you can put restrictions on that when you spin it up in the cloud, but if you like accidentally expose this to the internet, it could, it could be a bad day. Of course, you could just spin it down uh, and, and, and fix everything because it is just a lab, but you know, you do run that risk. Um, I think it's awesome. I think um, there's multiple labs out there, right, that use similar mm -hmm. technologies so students can essentially spin all of this up uh, in an environment, but I think it's also nice for you to be able to control and configure your uh, environment as well. I mean, you could, if it was your cloud, you could do that as well. But in this example, right, I can change any of these Docker containers. I can add new ones. I can uh, remove them. So like when, you know, log4j isn't the shiny new hotness, something else is, I can swap that in if I need. Mm -hmm. What was the vulnerability du jour? Uh, Cassandra and Magento. So, I mean, I could continue yeah. to spin those up in there, right? And you could spin up a separate container for that or uh, build it into some other container. Uh, I know Samba had a vulnerability uh, recently we talked about as well. So that you can also go ahead, Tyler. You can also modify yeah. these and, and integrate these into your cloud lab or cloud solution using, you know, Ansible or Terraform. Yep. Uh, these work these work well for for spinning stuff up with inside of additional cloud environments and very, and are very adaptable to the the other languages. So yeah, it'd be awesome. Uh, I'm most familiar with AWS. Um. I'm assuming, I've not tried it, but I'm assuming you could spin up a Windows environment in AWS and a container environment in ECS, link them all together to be on the same network. From what I understand from AWS. I've not tried that, but I'm sure that's possible, right? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, and yeah. especially if you're using Vagrant files or Ansible. Yeah, and then you use Terraform as the orchestrator to spin it all up in the cloud. Yeah, whatever your flavor is this week. Yeah, there's multiple ways to do that, even in AWS, right? To spin all, yep. spin all this up. Yeah, there's a lot of people doing that too, and it, and I think that's cool. And you know, maybe you could adapt it to do that. I mean, we can just keep building on this because it's lots of fun. Um, but you know, the use case for me, I think it's nice for me to have it local. I can modify it, spin it up, and go, hey, like here's how you exploit this new exploit that's going to come out next month. Like here's how you exploit it and get C2 communications going. Yeah. It's fun. It's good stuff. And if I get really ambitious, I'll start writing up labs for it. So you can pull this down and spin it up and then follow along on a document and be like, all right, here's step by step how you nice. do like this from, you know, step one to step 12. I, I've done that already for at least one of the segments that I did. So keep building on it. It's pretty cool, man. I got to give you credit. That is actually pretty cool. You've developed a way to put a whole lab on a work on a, uh, 
on a laptop or a decent desktop uh, without using VirtualBox, which is becoming more and more not usable these days, without you, you know, and, and doing everything pretty straightforwardly. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Josh. Kind of I, I have I have VirtualBox uh, running in a couple of different instances to spin up labs, and I did find it takes one, it takes up a lot of resources, and two, like if it's you don't create it like within VirtualBox for VirtualBox, like it, stuff goes horribly wrong, right? Like it likes to be all native within uh, within VirtualBox, but yeah, it does it does suck up some uh, resources big time. Yeah, VirtualBox is getting like I, I don't know. My personal opinion, this is my personal opinion, is that VirtualBox is getting behind the times. Yeah, it is and, free. Uh, it is free. I mean, for those just starting out, right? You've got to pay for VMware Workstation or ESXi, and you would have to or pay for your cloud computing costs, right? Oh, what is what is Docker cost? What is yeah, it's all, uh, this is all free, uh, right? It's Dude, all free. And how does you just the build everybody a free lab? My question for you folks is how does the Windows licensing work? I can spin this up in eval mode, no harm, no foul. Yeah, Microsoft provides a 180 day uh, trial for development and labs. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their EULA for that particular license and uh, version. So I'm not even violating the EULA because I really am using this for a lab. Yep. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so I think it's a really cheap way to do it. Yeah, cool. it really is. Honestly, uh, do you have? Are you documenting this? How well is it documented that mm. somebody who's not incredibly sophisticated could put this together? Mm. The documentation is not great. There is some documentation there, but it is it is not it is not great. Because usually I'm like, I got to get this working, and then show it on the show, and then I, I never go back and flesh out. Paul's looking for an intern to follow him around, dictating yes. whatever he. Yes. <laughs> we need. We I gotta get intern Dylan uh, on this project and helping me document it. Yes, that should be the next step. I should have Dylan spin this up and run into all the issues and then help with the documentation. That would actually be pretty good, yeah. and it could uh, good learning. You know, like experience. for example, we had Kevin on the on the webcast today, yeah. right? So, uh, Secure Ideas manages the Samurai WTF distribution, yeah, and they they manage several different uh, uh, open source projects. This would be a pretty nice open source project to come out of Security Weekly. Agreed. Agreed. Very. Yeah. I hope people use it, enjoy it, and, you know, send me pull requests. Or if you want to write up some documentation, like, this is open and free, right? This is this is so people can mm -hmm. learn, right? Awesome. With that, uh, we'll take a short break. Come back. Talk about security news for this week. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 